Hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for this event on creating a safe workplace culture and preventing sexual harassment. Um, first of all, a little bit of Zoom business. Um, so we're going to be using the Zoom Q&A function today and um, this can be found on the actions ribbon at the bottom of the screen. There's uh, live captioning and use the transcription button to access that. The event's being recorded um, and the chat will be turned off for the event. And please do tweet as we're discussing and tag the Fawcett Society um, and we'll be able to share those tweets. I'm Jemima Olhavsky. I'm the Chief Executive of the Fawcett Society. Um, so we all know that sexual harassment in the workplace can be absolutely devastating. And certainly it's devastatingly common with four. 40% of women experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace at some point during their working lives. And that proportion shoots up for disabled women, LGBTQ plus women. But unfortunately, the EHRC has found that in half of cases where employees made a report to their employer, that employer took no action at all, minimised the experience, or put the responsibility on the employee who'd been harassed to avoid the harasser in the future. So it's clear that we need change. Um, the government in July 2021, um, following campaigning from the Forsyth Society and others, has committed to introducing a new prevention duty where employers will be expected to take steps to prevent sexual harassment happening in the first place. So ahead of that, we've been really glad to work with our four nation partners, uh, Quarateg, Women's Resource and Development Agency and Close the Gap to create this toolkit to support employers to take those preventative steps and respond appropriately. So today um, to talk about our findings and that project and to launch that toolkit, I'm joined by four really excellent speakers. First of all, Alison Henderson, who's Policy and Research Manager at the Forsyth Society, is going to take a bit of time to talk through that resource and our findings. And then we're going to hear responses and reflections and have a bit of conversation with Deba Saeed, Senior Legal Officer at Rights of Women, Dame Heather Rabatz, Chair of Times Up UK, and Claire Walker, Co-Executive Director of the British Chambers of Commerce, followed by a Q&A with a chance for you to add in your questions or thoughts. Before we get started, I want to say a few thank yous. Um, so I want to say thank you to our project chair, Marai Larasai, for her invaluable support and insight on the project. Um, to the Justice and Equality Fund from Time's Up, provided through Rosa for their funding and support for this project, which has been absolutely vital. And to the Charter Management, Management Institute for their support in providing our managers survey. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Alison to share some of the materials and findings that we're launching today. Thanks, Jemima. Really happy to be here. I'm Alison Henderson. I'm Policy and Research Manager at Fawcett. Um, and I'm here to talk about this focus on how we're creating a workplace culture that will prevent sexual harassment. And particularly, this work has focused on what employers can do about this. So um, in July last year, the government committed to this legislation for a duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment. And this is really a change because previously it, it only required you to take reasonable steps. So this is a much more proactive step. Um, very exciting to see. And I think um, employers will find it really benefits them as well. Um, this is because many people think that sexual harassment is really only about some big incident. And it's easy to say that doesn't happen where I work or where I am. But in fact, it's often these very, very small incidents, whether it's a comment or a joke or just looks or intrusive questions about someone's life. And all these lead up to a culture where this kind of thing is just assumed to be normal and treated as acceptable banter. And yet that's very painful. It can be very traumatic and upsetting to be experiencing that on a daily basis. And so this is part of why people don't report sexual harassment, because it's not perceived to be taken seriously because of that kind of culture behind it. And for a lot of people, um, there's a real concern about career or personal impacts. It can be incredibly negative and part of the decision to report. Um, people also often worried about upsetting those around them, damaging a team dynamic. And then the reporting means having to relive the trauma, which could be really significant um, depending on your situation. 
So what have we been doing? We have done a review of the evidence that sets out what we know really looking at best practice. We've published this with our partners at Hard Tech, WRD and Closed Gap um, last year, and it forms the basis for our employer toolkit. We went through all the um, literature on what works, captured all that. We um, did a survey where we heard from women who experienced sexual harassment. We asked for evidence about this. What improvements would they like to see? And what's currently happening in workplaces? And I think perhaps most unusually, we surveyed managers with support from the CMI to explore how they perceive this and their views on best practice. So the findings are in the report. I won't go through all of those. But let's look at some of the sort of specifics we got back. Um, and um, this is very important because lives are being damaged by this and business productivity is definitely being reduced and organizations are unaware of the true impact. So they can't take the correct actions to address this. So apologies if those are difficult for anyone to hear who has been affected by sexual harassment. So we've got um, a woman on the left in the private sector saying, they were asking, am I sure this is sexual harassment? I even went to the government website and showed them a description and still they were asking, am I sure? So we're just seeing that lack of understanding. And then the need for empathy. Um, the woman here at the top is saying, my employer should have just once said, sorry, this has happened to you, let us help. And then the impacts on, as we see here, sort of work life can be very, very significant. Someone was moved from one city to another, made to feel I was at fault, the quote is saying, yet there were no consequences for the senior person who had subjected me to the harassment. And it is often this someone more senior is a factor because sexual harassment sort of has that power dynamic kind of built into it. But looking slightly more on the bright side, um, managers really wanted to do better. And we can see that that support makes a difference. So a woman on the left here in the private sector has said, what worked well was the person I told, a more senior woman, took my report seriously and expressed sympathy and shock. This felt validating and gave me the confidence to speak to HR. Another person over here as a middle manager in the pu public sector has said it would have been useful to have a trained, dedicated manager champion this. Very great self-awareness from this individual. I'm a male in my mid-40s. I manage a team in their mid-20s. Whilst I hope I'm approachable and will always respond appropriately to reports of sexual harassment, I understand speaking to me may be another daunting step for a victim. And lots more in our report where managers are really wanting to do better and wanting the support and the environment and the context to take that forward and do what they can personally supported by systems and structures in the organization. So the other thing we're often been asked about, oh, well, surely online working has made this better. And sadly, it hasn't. It creates new avenues for people um, to uh, indulge in harassment, basically. Um, and so data has shown that uh, women have been uh, harassed more. This is actually from our partners at Rights of Women. Uh, things have increased or escalated since the start of the pandemic. And things like social media can provide particularly, um, particular channels for other kinds of sexual abuse. So what is the solution to this? It's to create a workplace that doesn't tolerate sexual harassment. And for this, there are five key requirements. So taken together, these add up and reinforce each other. The first requirement is overall cultural change within the organization. Then going round our circle, have a standalone sexual harassment policy. Train people in the, in the workplace. This would be train everybody about sexual harassment. Have in place reporting mechanisms that make it safe and easy to report that. And then when an incident occurs, respond to it with empathy and respect. And that will create the environment, create the virtuous circle such that people will be able to report the good action will reinforce e each other and it will create an environment where sexual harassment does not happen in the first place. So this, the aim is, will support your organisation to be ready for the forthcoming government duty to prevent sexual harassment. To do this, we've produced the employer toolkit, which is available from our website. And this will support employers to change culture, put in place those elements, the policy, the training, making safe and easy, responding. You can adapt it to suit your organizational needs. You'll need to look at what kind of workplaces, what kind of balances of people, 
how many sites, are they large or small? What are the interactions with clients or customers? All those kind of things. And then you can listen and embed feedback from employees, which will make a huge difference in getting it right. And we cover off both hard and soft tools. So you'll want to train structural things, for example, targeting, things like that. But you'll also want to change softer skills, management skills, and sort of training and communications will support all of those. Okay, that's about it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, so now to move to our panel, just to get your thoughts and reflections. Um, Heather, if it's okay, I wondered if I could start with you um, as chair of Time's Up. Um, now, obviously, Time's Up um, was formed in response to the Me Too movement and in particular around those revelations around Harvey Weinstein. And I think one of the things that comes out very clearly in it, there and in this research is the role of power in this. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how, how power is playing out here and how we need to think about that in our workplaces. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and um, you're absolutely right that following the creation of Times Up UK, what we've been trying to focus on is how do you shift culture and principally how do you change power? Um, and to do that requires a myriad of interventions which we've been working on and we're obviously very pleased through the monies that we raised to have donated this to Rosa and to the research that we, we see here today. Um, dealing with sexual harassment is about being multi-layered and I think we've just been able to see some of that in the present in the presentation and for us in Time's Up we've been trying to again focus on very um, uh, specific interventions so in every production now there is a very clear policy statement around that there is no tolerance to sexual harassment. There are places to go. There's guidance available. No actor needs to give an audition in a hotel room, which was done frequently um, uh, up until recently. And, and that in a microcosm just shows power that you're taken to a place which is not safe. You're alone. You're vulnerable. Um, and you are met with people who will control your career. And, and therefore power is manifested in that little crucible, as we can see in a number of ways. So how do you tackle that? You tackle that by saying you don't go. We, you tackle that by being really aware of your rights, but also you tackle it by beginning to ensure that there are more women and people of color in positions of power. So we've also focused on having more uh, women directors. We know if we have more women directors, the culture on set tries to begins to shift and so I think what's really significant about the work that's being done here is how we take learning that we're all gathering from our different sectors and apply it to workplaces I sit on boards this is a really valuable toolkit that everybody can use to as as has been said prepare for the new legislative requirement but more importantly than that actually create a culture where everybody is safe and treated with dignity and respect um you know sadly i began my life as a as a as a barrister volunteering with rights of women uh working on sexual harassment sadly it was a very long time ago um but it shows how ingrained and inbuilt sexual harassment is in our workplace culture where people have power over other people um, and that's why empowering people empowering employers to tackle it is hugely important and I'm, I'm really glad to be here today and welcome this toolkit. Thank you. Um, Deba, um, Rights of Women offers support to women who've experienced sexual harassment. How, how do you see that fear around the impact this might have on someone's career playing out? And perhaps you could talk a little bit about the impact for those women of these experiences. Yes, so it's a pleasure to be here. It's really great to be part of a conversation, something constructive about sexual harassment. And so this toolkit is going to be really powerful and useful, I think, to employers. Since Rights of Women in 2019, with the support of Time's Up and, and the money raised through the Time's Up movement, we launched our free 
legal advice line for women who've been sexually harassed in the workplace. And we have been collecting data straight as a frontline organisation from these women, really getting a picture of what it's like on the ground um, for them. And in our first year of operation, we were getting these, you know, really kind of horrible numbers coming through. Nearly half of all our callers told us that they had actually been sexually assaulted in the workplace. And 75% of those women had also experienced some kind of victimization, some kind of less favorable treatment after the harassment happened. So what does that tell us? It tells us that reporting sexual harassment is a risk. It is a huge, viable, completely logical risk that women would be reluctant to report sexual harassment. And we see from our numbers, more likely than not, that they're probably gonna experience some kind of retaliation either from the perpetrator or from the organisation as a whole. Um, and I think a lot of women don't realise that when they report sexual harassment. They're coming in good faith. They're often just telling the, the you know, the employee, you know, you might want to know about this. In our experience, you know, they often experience, you know, weeks, months, maybe even years of harassment before they even contemplate making a, rep a report. And they're really, you know, asking the employer to help them because they, they can't do their jobs anymore. They, they, the perpetrator is making it so difficult that they just can't do their job. Um, and so the types of retaliation we see, um, it's really interesting. The, the sort of most common one is, I think, built on a wider problem, I think, which underpins sexual harassment is that a lot of employers are working off myths. They're working off kind of sexist myths, which are pervasive in society. And that is their starting base. And so when they respond to a sexual harassment report, they are, you know, like just like Alison said in her um, presentation, you know, we see a lot of victim blaming. We see a lot of um, a lot of kind of um, putting the onus on the woman to kind of solve the response to solve the situation acting like it's some sort of private misunderstanding between the perpetrator and the victim when of course you know it's an employer's responsibility but i think in terms of your question jemima the the actual impact is significant on women because it is still the most sensible thing to do if you're being sexually harassed the most logical sensible thing to do is to just leave your job just go to another job and work somewhere else because there will be less risk to your career, to your reputation. It's still the most sensible choice. So really, like in a way, we don't really have the true scale of the problem. But the women who do report, our numbers say that more often than not, they are going to be um, leaving that organisation either willingly because they just quit or unwillingly because they are um they're offered a settlement, often an NDA as part of that settlement, and exited from the organisation. And so what we see, women telling us over and over and over again that the perpetrator has, um, you know, a history of problematic behaviour, a history of bullying, a history of racist comments, a history of other, other kind of problematic behaviour. But instead of the perpetrator ever feeling any consequence, you just see a stream of women who have kind of left the organisation because of him, indirectly because of him, because of the culture that he's created. Um, and that's the reality of the situation. Most women, so I think it's a third of the women we spoke to have dismissed or been resigned. And we also have a huge amount of women telling us that they're actually signed off sick from work because of the harassment. Uh, making it so difficult. So that's just a flavour of what the reality is like. Thank you so much, Diva. Um, so Claire, coming to you from the British Chambers of Commerce perspective, I mean, it's clear there are real costs to employers here of not being proactive and not getting this right. Absolutely. You know, I think this is such, first of all, just such a welcome initiative. You know, I think the fact that we have a toolkit and we can talk about uh, how we can implement that with small and medium sized firms um, uh, and BCC will be promoting it to our members uh, at, is a really, really welcome step forward. We need we need to remember uh, that this is this is exactly what firms need and, 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 and we're incredibly grateful for it. Just a little bit about the BCC first, you know, we, we represent 53 chambers which have thousands of businesses um, up and down the country in our membership and the vast majority of those are small and medium sized firms. So about 90% of firms in the country are small and medium sized firms. And that really matters um, when we address this issue. And I'll come on to that in a minute. I just wanted to say first though, that you know, addressing sexual harassment and um, you know, equality in the workplace as one of the most 
senior job shares in the country has been at the heart of everything that me and my partner has tried have tried to do. And you know, this is particularly raw subject for me because as a very young, ambitious uh, individual, I was sexually harassed by a senior man in an organisation, and and all of those power conversations that. Dame Heather spoke about were things that I experienced when I didn't have power. And now to a certain extent, I'm able to use the, the network to make sure that that's a better circumstance for many women who are not in the same situation. But this, this cuts deep for me and I'm really welcome to be here. I mentioned about small and medium sized firms being a core issue. And I'm not saying that larger firms uh, uh, are, are excused from this, but they do have HR functions. And I think one of the things that we hear from our members is that 90% of small and medium sized firms don't have any HR function. And that matters because there's no systematic approach. And so while I think firms up and down the country would really welcome this new uh, guidance and the new legislation, I think they would not really know how to implement it or maybe not have the resources of how to implement it. And that's why this toolkit actually is one of the most important steps forward. But also as we move towards legislation, we need to think of what are the small steps. And I think that we can move to, to a more equal um, workplace. So what are the small steps that employees can take uh, to ensure that things uh, feel like a better culture, more equal culture? What are the training that they need to give senior staff? And what is the reporting mechanism that firms can bring in when they don't have an NHR function? And I was really struck by one of the recommendations of the report, which is which is that you know you need multiple uh, reporting structures, which I think is absolutely right. But actually, for smaller firms, we need to be more creative as to how that would be, what other mechanisms can be brought in to ensure that you have that overall approach that means that there isn't only one person to go that happens to be the owner, that happens to be the manager, and it happens to be the boss. And we need to think as to how uh, best smaller firms can do that. And I think then there's another reason, like morally, I think we're all uh, absolutely committed to this agenda, but there's another reason why this is really important. As we're coming out of the pandemic, our economy really needs some repair. And we know that lots of women are choosing not to participate in the workforce because they, you know, they feel uncomfortable, they feel like it's not a situation where they want to enter. And actually, if we all move towards a more equal uh, workforce and we take those steps, we look at how we can address um, the really terrible instances of sexual harassment, but also the baby steps to a more equal society, then, you know, estimates suggest that actually we could bring over a hundred and uh, 50 billion pounds just to the British economy. Now that's a huge amount of money that we can then use in tax revenues to do some of the things that we want to do. So there's both a moral uh, need to do this. Absolutely, it's 100% the right thing. We need to look at how we can train, support um, and educate small and medium sized firms and we will play our role in that. But there is also an economic reason to do this. You know, we're, we need to all use all of our skills in this country, whether they be from uh, diverse groups, whether they be from men, from women, um, uh, in order to drive us forward. Um, so we can all benefit. So this is an incredibly uh, welcome introduction. I'm really looking forward to the questions um, and the debate later. Um, but thank you for putting this session on. Thank you so much, Claire. And can I ask, do you think employers are ready for the change and for the new duties that are set to come their way? I think that's an excellent question. I would say on the whole, no. And that's where we need to make sure uh, that, and, and just to say on that, actually, that's the situation with small and medium sized firms on any legislational change, um, whether or not that's a tax regime, whether or not that's Brexit, they struggle for the reasons that we, that we whether that's COVID actually, we struggle for the reasons that, that, that we talked about, the fact that they don't have the systems and processes. So I think we have to you know, fully recognise that this needs to be gone, uh, it needs to be implemented, but we also need to look at how we work together to ensure that it is, and what are the things that are specific to firms that are of smaller sizes and, and larger sizes as well, to think about how they implement. I think, you know, we're all committed on the goal. We've just got to make sure that the journey feels inclusive to that group uh, so that we can bring them with them. Because I think yeah. if it feels to uh, uh, them and us, I don't think necessarily we'll get the outcome that we all want around the table. Thank you. And I think one of the strengths of 
the resources that we're launching today is that they are scalable um, and they provide kind of lots of information so that if you kind of really at the beginning you don't have an HR department they point you in the direction or provide you with the things that you need to get started um, and where to look for more for more support. Heather you talked about the culture change that you've been pushing for across the creative industries across the film and television industries. Have have you got any kind of lessons or insights from where that sort of happened and been sort of effective or, or gone fairly smoothly and maybe somewhere it was actually a bit more challenging than you might have anticipated? I'm not sure anywhere has gone smoothly. I think we, we were, all, were all learning and there are many bumps in the road. And I think just being able to share the conversation between different sectors is, is really Im, Im, important. Um, I mean... I don't think one can underestimate the seismic shock of Weinstein and that actually so many had been complicit with the behaviour. Um, and I think that did give an impetus behind us, which made everybody sit up and say, we do have to, we now really have to attend to this. Um, and I think that momentum has been very important, but sustaining the momentum, you know, as we all know with news, it's in the news one day, it's gone the next. So how do we sustain momentum? And that's really by ensuring that this conversation continues at every level. So whether it's the beginning of every production, you get sat down and you'll talk to, through what are your rights and what and, and behavior that will no longer be acceptable. Whether you're a talent agent who sits down with a, a young actor for the first time and tells them about both their rights and their responsibilities about how they behave. I think that point that's been mentioned that Deba mentioned that for many, you know, still not believed, retaliation is real. In, in the film and television industry, it's patronage, you're a freelancer, you don't have any organisation behind you, you're often alone. So one of the most important lessons we have learned is that is to be able to talk to others, seek help, seek advice, bring allies along with you that you're not alone. Um, that for employers to make it very clear before any complaint is raised. Uh, in every induction, this is what this company stands for. This is These are our values as a company. These are our ethics. And within that, how people are treated with dignity and respect. And just by maintaining the volume on this, I think it at least helps to mitigate that fear of isolation and retaliation. Yeah, I think that's um, really important. And that fear of retaliation is something I've seen is coming through in the chat. And, and it it's real and I think it connects to that issue that Diva you raised around the prevalence of myths of um, victim blaming of the misogynistic ideas that often suggest that actually it's the responsibility of the victim to solve this or it's somehow her fault and it is almost always women um, or in the main women who experience this. What do you think, what do you see as the kind of most common mistake that you hear when women are getting in touch that employers have made and are there kind of do you ever see in that kind of moments of, of good practice that you would point to as well um the most common um mistake um well look i mean it's it's not really in an interest employer it's not in an employer's interest to um uphold a sexual harassment grievance really um so most of the time you know because they're basically you know missing liability for harassment and discrimination so a lot of the times it's a lot of mental gymnastics to try and get themselves off the hook um to distance themselves you know as legally as possible um within this, the constraints of the law to um not take responsibility because the law is quite um you know the, the you know employers can only they have to take all reasonable steps to prevent harassment in the workplace that is the the only defense available to them um so if they admit liability they are um, you know, leaving themselves open to claims. So basically, it's just a lot of like denial that the sexual harassment happened in the first place. Um, what we see really, really common is workplace investigations um, being conducted in a very unfair way. So the women, you know, often they will not have um, they will not have witnesses. They won't because these things are being done behind closed doors. 
um, and they won't have, you know, quote unquote, hard evidence. And they will take that to the employer and the employer will say, right, well, we asked the perpetrator and he said that he didn't do these things. So that's the end of the matter, um, which is obviously, you know, completely hopeless. But I think just to touch more broadly on what you're saying, Jemima, about um, sexual harassment myths, I feel it's really, really important that we kind of not just focus on women who are in kind of career jobs and are going places because to be honest the majority of the women that we support are kind of a lot of them are working in sort of frontline roles we had a huge amount of calls from women who are working in the NHS nurses carers people who work in precarious work and because they're um, what their rights are less than other types of workers, it makes them more vulnerable to harassment. For example, I'm thinking of agency workers, um, particularly things, there's been a rise or, or a lot of research recently on people, domestic workers, you know, cleaners who do app-based um, clean cleaning or they work through agencies. It's really easy for the agency to kind of not take responsibility and leave that woman out in the cold. And of course, it won't be her career that's affected. It will be her livelihood and her ability to pay her jobs and things like that. Um, and that's something we see again and again, especially from migrant workers who are, might be reliant on um, a visa or they might be scared that raising a report might threaten their ability to be in this country. So they're going to have no kind of incentive to, to want to report. So I think that's a really kind of broader issue we need to think about if we're going to tackle sexual harassment at all in the workplace, because... Um, yeah, that's not just that's not going to go away if women are so fun, fundamentally less equal. And I think that's really feeds into Claire's point about a lot of the women we speak to actually are from much smaller family run organisations where the power dynamic is so pronounced because the perpetrator might be the person might be the owner or the person that you're expected to report to. So it just makes the entire kind of grievance process redundant because you're, there's no, you know, you're not going to get a fair hearing in that situation. So I think it's addressing the fact that it's going to be women who are more likely to be in those roles, doing kind of admin roles, doing uh, hospitality um, and those kinds of roles. But I, just to give you an example, I mean, I, I spoke to a 19 year old the other day who, um, was sexually assaulted in the workplace and her employer, this is extremely common, but her employer told her, um, well, you should report this to the police. It has nothing to do with us. Um, and that, you know, kind of had a very devastating impact for her. But I think that is a very persuasive myth that um, certain things are not the empl employer's responsibility or things we see a lot of, you know, the rise of social media. A lot of harassment is happening through social media and things like that. And um, the employer, you know, will just say this is not our responsibility. So it's really important to kind of be aware of how the circumstances are changing, but not forgetting that the majority, I think it's half of women still work in, you know, uh, in a, not in a, in a workplace, they don't work from home. I think that's a bit of a myth that um, everyone was just working at home during the pandemic. To be honest, most of the women were not, they were working in frontline roles and being subjected actually to worse working conditions and making them more vulnerable to harassment, bullying, um, and that kind of thing. But I, one other kind of thing I think it's really important to state is um, the women who, we speak to you know they don't just speak they don't just uh, experience sexual harassment they are often nearly half of our callers had experienced another type of discrimination as well and the most common being was race discrimination or disability discrimination um, and obviously you know if you know the equality act you know that race discrimination doesn't have to be just based on color of skin it can be based on um what their country of origin and so we see certain groups of women who are particularly sexualized, who happen to be working in lower paid jobs. Um, I'm thinking, for example, Eastern European kind of groups of women who are um, really vulnerable to uh, harassment and, and hyper sexualized as a group of women um, who experience a lot of race discrimination as well. So I think a broader project for us all is not to just focus on sexual harassment, but to look at how, you know, employers should really be educating all of their employees about all of the protected characteristics and how they interact with each other. Um, and, you know, not just kind of let the, you know, this is, this is only the beginning of the chapter sexual harassment. I think that's really important. Thank you, Dee. But exactly, we sort of need to 
deepen and broaden our understanding and think about the ways that racial stereotypes can interplay with misogyny or sexism and mean that particular women experience sexual harassment differently or there's, there's the nature of it can be different um and the power um that sort of goes back to those issues around power where women have insecure migrant status um or dependent on an employer in that way it's it's incredibly difficult for people to speak out and challenge it's why it's so important that employers hold that responsibility to be proactive rather than waiting for something to happen and waiting for someone to take that incredibly difficult decision to report we've got some questions um so um to audience members please do keep adding them in and i'm gonna take a few at a time now and um ask our panel to respond um so um a question here says um often victims are young at the start of their careers um, and don't want to see huge consequences for the person who's harassed them in case it affects their careers, um, although they want to report about it so they're known. Um, so what can happen and how can victims have more ownership of the reporting process? Um, and then we've got a couple of related questions, I think, in part there about men as allies. So how can men be part of the solution? And another question that says, how do how important are male allies in this discussion and how do we balance this with men who hold a history of poor perception so of course some men will be allies um but sadly many are not and will come at this with those out of date um and damaging ideas that we've discussed um claire can i come to you first for your thoughts on any of those yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of very, you know, tricky issues here. The first thing I would like to stress around male allies, I think they're absolutely vital, as is female leadership as well. And I think one of the case studies um, that we saw was about someone going to a female leader and, um, and, and saying, actually, you know, this is going on and, and her believing um, her. And I think the first thing I'd say that is that is a, if there's hundreds of reasons why to have more women in leadership, that's another great example which should be addressed. I think on the male ally thing, I, I truly believe that this is a whole needs a whole gender approach. You know, this can this needs men calling out men. It involves women feeling empowered that they can address uh, poor behaviour and it needs more women in leadership and I think you know, someone was telling me uh, and I, I don't want to go into too many details but obviously but that, that, that there was someone that was doing some deeply un inappropriate uh, behaviour in an organisation and um, they as a senior leader uh, uh, called it out and, 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 and moved forward because again they were in a position of power so they were able to call it out and they felt empowered as a male leader to call it out and then that that was addressed but I think that's why larger organizations where possible need to be looking at uh, this is an a you know a part of training of all staff and particularly of 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 leadership but small organizations need to be thinking about what else they can access from outside and i think there was one of your questions actually was what other bodies can help and i think actually that's the next stage of this isn't it the next stage beyond legislation is how do we embed it what do we know works how can we train people so that we've got you know a whole um whole approach and what we learned from some of the difficult uh, uh situations in um the uh, theatre and arts is it's not just women, it is on the whole women, and Deba is absolutely right to highlight those groups, but it's also uh, people with other characteristics such as LBGT um, that are also facing uh, sexual discrimination. So I think without a whole, a whole organisation, whole gender approach, we're never going to move this forward. But there is a real role for leadership here and a real role for senior leaders to take this seriously and believe and act. Thank you. Heather. I mean, I think I just echo really what Claire has said. I, I, I don't think we should, uh, for one second, uh, underestimate the importance of leadership, whether you're in a small company, medium-sized company or large co co company, that people understandably look to their leaders. But what is the value set? What is the moral compass of this organisation that I work in? And the more that you communicate what the ethics and the values of that company, um, which obviously is a statement around um, 
the absolute um, zero tolerance of sexual harassment, of racial discrimination, of all those discriminations that come together to make people, certain people's lives a misery. That is their responsibility to hold that and to constantly convey it. It is also the responsibility though, and this is one of the points I often try and stress that if you're in a situation and you see something that happens, what do you do? All of us, what, where, wherever we are, is we also have a responsibility not to not to sort of lean back and stay quiet, but to step in and say, and you needn't do it in an aggressive way, but just to say, do you know, I'm not sure that, that I don't think that point, that comment was appropriate. And, and the more that one person does that, it, it has this incredible ripple out effect because it means that others who did feel uncomfortable, including some of those men who think actually that's not right, that that helps them step forward because this is a huge issue. You know, Hollywood was built on selling sex. You know, it is fundamental in the film business. And yet we have made progress. And that is because it starts with one person calling it out and then two and then three and then groups and then teams and then organizations. And whilst I absolutely know how frightening and how scary it is for any of us as individuals when we've had those experience to step forward, it is I think where we are now is the importance of everybody else to step forward. And that is one of the ways that I think we can really help to, you know, have actions that mean that, you know, I hope that when my granddaughter gets to work, you know, in 16 years time, she will not have to deal with the issues that so many of us are facing today. Thank you. Deba. Yeah, I would just, I would just build on all of that. Um, in terms of allyship, I don't, I don't know if that's the right way to think of it, but what I, what I'm, when I'm in a situation where I'm actually advising a woman, you know, this is, these are the steps you can take. You can make a report, but I know that actually making a report for her is going to put her in serious danger of losing her job. When I'm thinking about these issues and I'm thinking about what we can do to help, when I think of allyship, I really just think it's the men who, if they're in the positions of power, who are going to be the decision makers on a workplace investigation or do a disciplinary, there should be action, you know, there should be consequences for these actions. The simplest thing I think men in positions of power can do is discipline and dismiss people who sexually harass women in the workplace and it just sounds really obvious and basic but so many of the women we speak to um you know it's very rare for me to hear about a woman who's actually managed to get a perpetrator dismissed from the organization it will be usually her who is expected to move to a different department a different location to uproot her life i just think the simplest thing you know men in positions of powers can do is to um not just call it out but to punish the people who do it so that there is a clear message, there is a clear signal being, you know, telling everyone that this behavior will not be tolerated. You will be fired from your job if you do it. And I think that is the most effective way of getting people to believe it. And I'd say more generally as well, just on the, there's a quite good question there about how women can own the process. And I think that's a really, really valid point because we are encouraging women to come forward, report, 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 but it needs to be much clearer to them why they're going to do that. Why should they take that risk? And I think that's really simple stuff like explaining, these are gonna be the consequences if you sexually harass in the workplace. You will get a warning, you will get, you know, this, this, that, you know, having it in black and white and on a policy which everyone can read and know just makes it much more simpler because when women enter these processes, it feels like they're on a runaway train because most employers either massively overreact or underreact to the report and they kind of make up the, the system, you know, they make it up as they go along. And if it's just much more clearer to everyone that the reason I would make this report is because I'm going to expect this sanction it's going to mean, uh, you know, it's going to give them much more ownership of the process because often we find women are in these processes and it feels completely out of their control and they really regret, they really regret making the report. And uh, if they had a, had a bit more information and they could make more informed decisions. So that's why this toolkit is going to be good. But um, having clarity and, you know, what the point of reporting is, is going to, you know, encourage women, I think, more. Mm, I think that's really important. The moment of allyship is the moment you receive a report, taking that seriously, listening to that person, um, respecting their, 
their bravery and sharing that and then taking appropriate and proportionate action. And that might be really challenging. So it's really important to be prepared and to, to know in advance what your organization, um, what your organizational response is. Um, thank you. I've got so many questions coming in now. I'm we try, try to do my best to kind of filter through. So um, there's questions about what the role of professional bodies in, in supporting this kind of shift. Um, we've talked quite a lot about the need to get more women into leadership and into sectors to change that culture. But one of the questions is, well, and points to surgery as an example. Well, actually, sometimes there's really high prevalence of sexual harassment in a particular sector. Um, so what do we do about that circular issue of why would you encourage women into a space where they may feel unsafe or be unsafe? Um, and then questions about just understanding the kind of features of sectors that have the greatest problem. Um, so Heather, can I start with you? Um, I'm slightly uncomfortable with the idea that we create no-go areas in, in the areas of employment where we have, I mean, film and television and theatre, music, the, these are all areas that have been characterised um, and have characteristics of very high sexual harassment, racial harassment, discrimination. But if, if you're a singer, if you're an actor and that's your talent, why am I not going to find my voice? So what we have to focus on is safeguarding those people and ensuring that when they do go onto sets and in productions or go for auditions that, that, that they are properly protected. So I think the focus has to be on creating safe places and making the leadership accountable. And I'm going back to a point that Deba has mentioned, and this has happened in film and television. I mean, people have lost their careers because of their behaviour. I mean, there is sanction, there is now jeopardy. And believe you me, if you're now a senior commissioner in any, whether you're talking Netflix or Apple or any of these places, they all have incredibly rigorous processes in place. Doesn't mean you guarantee it every time, but in the last three years, it has changed enormously and we have to keep, we have to keep pushing. So, you know, my, my, and it times up focus is about how do you change the systems? How, how do you change the environment, which meant that, that this behavior has been tolerated, excused, and even added to. Um, so I think that that tends to be our, our focus. And within that, you know, are there advice lines? Are there support? Are there multiple ways in which you can report a, a point that was made raised earlier? Um, but I, I don't think it's about avoidance of an area because if you're talent that it is the only place you want to be it's about ensuring that you are safe when you're uh, when you're doing the job that you love and in other areas I mean times up in the US begins with um, the agrarian workers coming forward about how they have experienced sexual harassment and it's what what is important is that Wherever we are, whatever sector we are involved in, what is it that we can do that helps shift the dial? And, and clearly this toolkit is one of, is an example of that. Thank you. Diva. I think in, um, actually, you know, it's very interesting that regulators or professional regulators have a real kind of important role here. And I think a lot of women are very, they're unaware that they are able to go to a regulator um, they don't really understand the function of the regulator. And I think regulators do need to be more proactive um, and, and kind of take more intervention and steps. But I think the reality is, is that most women don't wanna raise a grievance. You know, they don't wanna kind of, you know, then they, most of the women I speak to just wanna inform the employer of something that they may not be aware about, which is the perpetrator's behavior. Instead of having to put themselves on the line, suddenly find themselves on trial, you know, proving all these allegations. I think a regulator is a very sensible measure where people can, you know, ideally be able to report anonymously and tell, you know, so that they can build up a picture of whether this person has a, you know, a serial kind of problematic behavior and that they can intervene without a woman having to kind of put herself on the line um, however that's really difficult unless you know uh, women are aware of that they know what the um, regulator will do and I think 
um, it helps. It helps to have that kind of independent place where they can go. But you've got to have, you know, belief that they're going to do something about that. And again, you've got to believe that, that believe that there's going to be sanction and and disciplinary action. And I think that's really, really appropriate in professions like surgery, the NHS. You know, these are people who um, the public are supposed to have confidence in. Women, you know, should be able to to be around these people who we are, you know, supposed to rely on. Um, so. Um, yeah, so I think the employer, you know, regulators should take a more kind of proactive step to kind of build up profiles, if necessarily, if necessary, of people who are, um, you know, not fit to be in that profession. And I think the film and TV industry or, or all industries should have it really, because, um, you know, the women, you know, a lot of the women I speak to in hospitality and retail, you know, there's just nowhere to go. There's nowhere, there's nowhere to kind of escalate it to. So the kind of problem just kind of persists. Thank you. And Claire? I, I, mean, I think all of that is right. Um, I think I just wanted to make a point about leadership programmes again, a slight, slight uh, a repeti repetition. And one of the things that I do in my personal time is I mentor on the Leaders with Babies programme, which uh, is a cross-sectoral approach and, and employees uh, nominate uh, leaders, men and women, but on the whole women, uh, to, to, to develop their leadership and their, their leadership journey. They're seeing huge numbers of applicants from the NHS. So I think that, and, and, and because of the lack of numbers in, 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 in sectors, and, and um, I actually don't have a, an NHS uh, mentee at the moment, but that might be something I have in the future. But I, but I think, so I think they know that there is a, there's a gender problem. I think one of the things that is really important, both about this toolkit, but also around um, the campaign that needs to go forward to increase awareness is it's not just about gender equality because it's great to have female surgeons or you know female engineers it's because the culture that they create is one that's more inclusive and that we take steps towards um, a, a situation which is um, uh, one where sexual harassment is removed and so I think we've probably not made the connection as much as we could between leadership uh, in an equal society and then the, the out, outcomes in terms of sexual harassment and I, I just share a personal story um, that I'm sure Dame Heather will find very funny but uh, someone I, I know very closely is it, it works in in the film industry and she was talking to me about um, intimacy coordinators um, after I fell in love with the program Bridgerton which I'm sure many of you also enjoyed and she was telling me that the intimacy coordinators work entirely new concept and I simply couldn't believe that for so long uh, we had put men and women, but mainly women in vulnerable situations without that independent uh, person. And I'm sure Dame Heather has got a lot to say about whether they're good or bad, but I was just extremely surprised that we had allowed something so intimate to continue without some support. Yeah, no, intimacy coordinators has been a big area of work for us at Times Up. They are now used on every set. And, that, and that, I'm, I you that that example I think you know s signals how ha the shift that's happened in three four years. People would never directors would have not thought that they needed an intimacy coordinator. Now it's a requirement. Uh, we also have people on set to try and tackle bullying and all of those other areas of sexual harassment that have been uh, uh, talked about earlier. So there, there's actually a place to go to when you're on set. But all of these practices, are, you know, many of these practices are transferable. Is there somewhere if you're in the NHS that you can go to? Is there somebody who holds that label on their head to be a support guidance for you if you're experiencing bullying and harassment and who can then help support you uh, in terms of how it's dealt with? There are very few women chief execs of hospitals. There are very few black people who are chief execs and leaders in the NHS. There's a big program underway to change that. And it's fundamental that our leadership starts to look like <laughs> us as a population. Thank you so much. Um, that's the end of our time for today. Um, so that's a brilliant point to end on. Thank you, Heather. So I want to say thank you to our panel, to Alison for opening um, up the discussion and then to Deba, Claire and Heather for your comments. And Claire, thank you for sharing your personal experience, which is, um, we really appreciate you sharing that with us. I think it's clear from today, um, some, some kind of clear messages for me are about that importance of leadership um, and 
for employers to play a role and recognize they need to be prepared and it's better to prevent and be proactive than to wait and respond. But also this is part of a broader culture. And if we address inequalities, if we address racism, um, misogyny, um, things like the gender pay gap and women's representation in our organization, we're also taking steps to prevent sexual harassment. Um, there's resources available as part of the toolkit um, there's details shared in the chat for those. Um, so please do look at those and use them in your organizations. Um, so as a, as a last I want to say thank you again to the partners we work with on this, Quirateg, Close the Gap and Women's Resource and Development Agency. Thank you to Rosa and Time's Up funding and making this possible. <laughs> and to all of you for coming and participating with so much energy and interest today. Um, Fawcett Society is a membership organisation. Um, you can join and support our work, so please do go to our website and do that to find out more. And I hope you'll join us at another event soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.